You're the CEO of Gable, which is a data contracts platform, and you're writing the definitive guide to data contracts with O'Reilly, probably the most prestigious technical publisher that you can be writing with for our space. So tell us about data contracts. You, your book introduces them as a solution to the persistent data quality and data governance issues that organizations face. Um, but candidly, it's not something that I had heard much about. When I first saw that, that that's what you were expert in, I was thinking about like Web3 or the blockchain. It somehow sounded like that kind of contract to me, but I don't think it has anything to do with that. That's right. So one of the big problems that has manifested itself in the last 10 or 15 years or so, really since the cloud took over as the primary place that uh, companies are storing massive amounts of data, is that oh, back in the old days, you used to have a, a producer of data and a consumer of data that were very tightly connected to each other and more of a centralized team that was thinking about the data architecture and which data is actually accessible and could, could be used by a data scientist or a data engineer or, or an analyst. And they went through a lot of time and effort to construct a highly usable, highly semantically representative data model. But now, thanks to the internet and thanks to the cloud, you've got so much data flowing in from everywhere, from hundreds, tens of different sources, and when things change, it causes lots of problems for anyone who's downstream of that data, for models, for reports, for dashboards, and things like that. So the data contract is starting to adopt a lot of the similar terminology and technology as software engineers who use APIs, which is effectively a service contract, right? It's an engineer saying, hey, like this is what my application produces. You can expect this not to change. Here are some SLAs around that service, and, and you can trust that there's, there's always going to be a certain level of latency and, and uptime. And we're, we're taking that approach and applying it to the data as well. Right. So it is similar in software engineering to the idea of, uh, what, is it, what is the term in software engineering? It's like a service contract. Service it's, contract, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you're taking those kinds of ideas from software engineering, applying them to data space. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, data is obviously very different from applications. Like you need to think about uh, the number of records that are being emitted at any particular point in time. If a team always expects there to be a thousand events in an hour, and in one particular hour it's one event or two events, that's definitely a big problem. The schema matters a lot. If you suddenly drop a column or add a new column that's an incremental version of a previous column, it's a really big deal. If you change the semantic meaning of the data, this is obviously another really huge deal. If I've got a column called distance and I, as the producer, have defined it to mean kilometers, but then I change it to miles, that's going to cause an issue. So the same sort of you know binding agreements that APIs have, sort of the, the explicit definitions of expectations coming from a producer, we're, we're starting to apply that to the data producers and not just the software engineers who own the application. Very cool. Sounds really valuable. In chapter two of your forthcoming book, you discuss how data quality isn't about having pristine data, but rather about understanding the trade-offs in operationalizing data at various levels of correctness. So how can organizations strike a balance between data quality and the speed of data delivery? That's actually a great question. So my definition of data quality is a bit different, I think, from other people's. Um, in the software world, folks think about quality as uh, it, it's very deterministic. So I am writing a feature, I'm building an application, I have a set of requirements for that application. And if the software no longer meets those requirements, that's what we call a bug. It's a quality issue. But in the data space, you might have a producer of data that is emitting data or collecting data in some way that makes a change which is totally sensible for their use case. So as an example, maybe I have a column called uh, timestamp and that's currently being recorded in local time and I as the engineer decide to change that to UTC format. Totally fine, makes complete sense. It's probably exactly what you should do. But if there's someone downstream of me expecting local time, they're going to experience a data quality issue. So. My perspective is that data quality is actually a result of mismanaged expectations between data producers and data consumers. And that's sort of the function of a data contract is to help these two sides actually collaborate better with each other.
to work better with each other and not so much prevent changes from happening. And so when you talk about data producers and data consumers, like you just did there, is that typically referring to internal in, or, in an organization, or I guess it could equally apply to um, an external facing API? It, exactly. So a producer is really anyone that is making a unique transformation of the data in some way, which could mean the creation of the data itself. That might be an internal software engineer who is creating an event that's emitted from a front end, like a user clicks on a button in a web app. It could be someone who, a DBA who owns a database. It could be a data engineer who's aggregating all of that data together and creating a silver and bronze and gold data models. It could be a data scientist who aggregates all of this into so, into a training set that ultimately another data scientist in the company ends up using. It could be a tool like a Salesforce or a CRM or SAP for an ERP, or it could be someone outside the company altogether, like another company providing an API or an FTP uh, sort of data dump or something like that. The problems are the same regardless. Mm -hmm. um, can you like break down for us? I'm kind of, as we've now been talking about data contracts, I kind of, I get the utility, but can you break down for me what they look like? <laughs> sure. Like how, does, how is it formatted? How do you share it? And like, how does somebody receive it? How do they read it? Yeah. So this is where data contracts are a little bit different from the service contracts where you have something like an, an open API standard. Uh, in the data contract world, it's more about having a consistent abstraction and then being able to enforce or monitor that abstraction in the different technologies where data is created or moved to. So I prefer using something like YAML or JSON to describe my contracts and it has various components within it. So you might lay out the schema, the owner of the data, the SLAs, the actual data asset that is being defined or being referenced by the contract, any data quality rules, PII rules, and so on and so forth. Um, and then the goal is to translate all of those constraints into monitors and checks against the data itself as it's flowing between systems or potentially even before that data has been uh, produced or, or deployed in some way. But I've seen teams that have rolled out data contracts as confluence pages, as Excel spreadsheets, really anything that allows a producer to take ownership of a data asset, I think works as a first step towards data contracts. Awesome. Yeah. Crystal clear. Um, let's talk about trustworthiness uh, mm. around data. So uh, we've talked now about data correctness, which relates to trustworthiness. And so you've argued that the value of data hinges on its trustworthiness. So how do data contracts help establish trust between data producers and consumers? And yeah, what role do data contracts play in rebuilding trust if it's been lost? So I think trust comes down to a couple components. One component of trust is understanding. And the second component of trust is meeting a consistent expectation. And when I say understanding, what I'm referring to there is I am more willing to trust a, a data source or a data set if I understand what it actually represents. When a table is called customer orders, does that mean customer orders that were placed to our website or through our application or through both or through our customer service line? Does it just refer to a certain type of customer or a certain type of order? So the more information I have about that data asset, the more that I can actually trust it. And then the second part of trust is the expectation setting. So what is going to happen to that data set over time? Is it going to be changing every month? Am I going to know when it changes? Will I know the context of the change so that I can adjust my training data or my query? I think the same is actually true in real life, right? Like if someone says to you, hey, John, I'm going to be come over, coming over to your house later, but I might be 30 to 45 minutes late because of traffic you'll respond very differently than if someone is just 45 minutes late and they don't tell you, they just show up. So I think this is where trust comes from. And the data contract is really all about setting the expectation and also helping people understand what the data actually means and how they should use it. 